I want to speak to you about the power of holy sexuality, a passage that many people mock in these days in the Old Testament, like Leviticus 18, verses 1 through 5, tells us that sexuality from God's perspective is always couched in His nature. Twice there, He says, I am the Lord. And following that is a list of about 20 different activities that God prohibits in His people. I'm intrigued that in the second chapter, verse of the next chapter, 19, 2, the Lord says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. So in the Bible, we find that sexuality and God's holiness are never very far apart. He knows we need His holiness and His power to deal with this incredibly powerful, passionate urge and reality for all of our lives. The problem for sex for me has been, and maybe your experience is like mine, is that I was told early on by my parents and their actions and reactions to sex in our, my culture that sex is dirty, but keep it for marriage. And I was confused by that. I, I didn't understand. And so as I grew up with this chaotic world of a sex-soaked, hormonal teenage life and the world in which I lived, I didn't know where to place these passionate, powerful things. I also found, shockingly, that the church didn't talk about this. So this powerful reality that all of us have, my parents were inadequate, they're wonderful people but inadequate, and I didn't find the church helping me. So even today, as a, as a grown man and a grandfather, I find myself having to always remind myself, where do I find a place that is truly pleasing to God in this area of sex and sexuality? The problem is, of course, that if we remove something as powerful as this from the presence of the Holy Spirit, if the Spirit can't guide us here, then all of us are going to find ourselves defeated and often hurting other people around us. We need a biblical view of holy sexuality. Now, what did God intend? All of us know that the Bible begins by God making His image in two people. That's Genesis chapter 1. That image, we find as the Bible continues, is an analogy. Not an idol, but an analogy of an intimate reality that God Himself offers to us in His own nature. He wants to be close to us. So from the Garden of Eden all the way until heaven, in the Bible, this picture of a man and a woman in covenantal love, giving themselves to one another, is an analogy, a picture of what holiness and holy love is to, is to point to. Now, sex, for us as humans, male and female, is inseparable from our createdness. And the Bible says not only is it a good thing, but it, from God's perspective, it's a very good thing. He said, it's very good I've given these two people, a man and a woman, to each other in this covenantal love. Our culture, of course, has made what is good to be not so good. Now, the symbol, as I've mentioned, this analogy, is, is to point to a different or deeper relationship. And that relationship, of course, goes beyond my physical being. Sin takes sex and makes it all physical. But God meant for me to love Him in my body and my soul my heart, and my physical life. And only He can put those things together. So this deeper relationship shown to us between one man and one woman is meant to reflect, be reflected in a much deeper and more grand relationship, which God Himself makes clear throughout the Bible. Now, I've mentioned sin already, but all of us know, and you can choose your own words for this, but if you remove sex, your sexual nature, and your actions from the Holy One, every one of us have gone through the same outline. We have taken this gift and made it something we use for ourselves. When you do that, you make a gift of God's good heart to our, us. You've made it a pragmatic thing, which means I take it and make it a thing. I make a person outside of me a thing I use for myself. I was thinking just this morning, I don't have, thank God, I don't have an addiction to pornography. I don't watch pornography. But if I were to watch it, I'm, I'm guaranteeing you that if I saw what was happening on the screens, it would be someone using someone else as a thing. There'd be no love, no intimacy, no self-giving. And that's what sin does to sex. Sin takes a holy gift and turns this powerful, passionate, pure desire of God that He plans for us, and it turns it into a thing that I use for myself, which is all sin, whatever you and I call sin in our lives. So we need to regain a biblical view, the image of God that He created as a good and a very good for us. But we also need to live with a true vision 
of holy sexuality. And I want to just deal with this a bit more because this is where you and I must, as salvationists, come in our culture to say, whatever happens around me, I'm going to always go here first. If the meaning of sexuality is I'm created in an image that God has ordained, male and female, to express myself sexually that way alone, then the purpose, the purpose of my sexuality is to recover a moral compass, lost at the fall, but can be recovered. And that moral compass, of course, for us in the army is always the Bible. Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20, Matthew chapter 5 and 6, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Paul, for instance, in Colossians chapter 3, all these pas passages all connect purity, holiness, love, and a proper use of our sexuality. We must not forget that. So the first sexual revolution, not the second, not the 1960s, the first one occurred when the Bible was written, when Moses in Leviticus said, don't use somebody for your own ends. God is holy. We must be holy. We must not be like our culture around us. We must be distinctive. And of course, Israel had their own difficulties, just like you and I have, but the standards never changed. So God revealed in this revolution after the fall of, of what true love looked like, what true relationships, fruitful, dynamic relationships looked like. And we must always go back to the scripture as our moral compass. I'm often asked by people, why are these weird little laws in the Old Testament? Why do we even look at them? Well, we look at them because they're specific. If you lose Leviticus 18, you lose any indication of sexual sins that are enumerated. They're listed there. The New Testament presupposes you and I know these laws. So these standards are not archaic. They're not something that just we can just do away with. For the Bible, it's an ongoing discussion of a very important part of life where the Lord says, I have guidance for you. I can guide you with a true vision of holy sexuality which abuses no one and bears rich fruit in your life, whether you're single or not. Now, the essence of sexuality for me is always theological. And I hope this is helpful to you because, again, that image talk, sometimes it gets a little bit, I don't know, esoteric, beyond my comprehension. Sexuality is a parable. It's a picture of reality written into my very being. In my physical life, I am made for another. Every one of us physically is made to give and to receive. Now, God made us that way because we are to relate to Him in a dynamic way. He gives His grace, we receive it. He gives His life, we receive it. And so, written into our very beings is this parable of the deepest and richest things. And for me, and I think in the army, if I'm not incorrect, our view of reality is God's exclusive, holy love. And we are to model that. So for me, as I move into this, this moral meaning of sexuality, I move beyond laws. It's way beyond do's and don'ts. Those are important. But that's not what God is saying. He's saying, if you do this, you'll be fulfilled. If you don't do this, you will not hurt those who are weaker than you. I love every one of you. I want all of you to be fulfilled. And if you follow my plan, my pattern, I will show you the full perp the meaning of sexuality. In my study over the years on this very important issue, I have discerned about six key things for me which never change in the Bible. The first one is our holy sexuality is always personal. Sex in the Bible is always between two persons, different from each other, but it's always to be known, to know and to be known. Secondly, it's exclusive, and that, of course, is Christian. This faithful lifetime commitment between a man and a woman mirrors God's faithfulness to us. Thirdly, it is always intimate. It is never just a function. It's never just an action. It's always a nurturing of a more intimate, important relationship beyond sexual activity, intimacy that God by His Spirit can produce. This is a difficult one for us in America, in the West. It's always meant to be fruitful in some sense. Now, I don't mean a person has to have a child, but I mean there must be the potential for this, which means, again, that two sexes are the biblical pattern for holy sexuality. Hotly debated, we need to love everybody, but I'm, I'm serious when I say the Bible never pulls off that reality. 
And if we pull off of it, we're going to lose our ministry to a culture and into our own family's lives. Fifth, it's always selfless. So this is very important. Self-giving in sexuality is always the core. It's never what I get or how I feel or am I having pleasure. It's always a desire to offer oneself to someone else in this covenantal love. And lastly, this may not help, but for me it's, it's complex. <laughs> sexuality is complex. It's, it's more than physical. And that's why if we're not engaged with the revelation of the Bible and fully aware of what's going on in God's agenda, we're going to be confused as to why this powerful thing is unleashed in our lives. Now, I want to close with this. We have a, uh, the meaning of sexuality, created image. We have the purpose, this parable of reality that is outlined in all of Scripture. But lastly, what is the pattern of holy sexuality? What's the, what's the goal of all of this? I've mentioned holy love, but I think as salvationists, we have a unique emphasis that we must not lose, and that is that when Jesus comes, He comes to deliver us. He sets us free. If you're enslaved in some sexual sin, Jesus can set you free. We know that's true. But then what? When Jesus rose from the dead, He went to heaven, and He sent His Holy Spirit. And His Holy Spirit now can fill my spirit. His Spirit can fill my body in the sense of being present to me and to you to help us to live out this exclusive, personal, faithful, holy, other-oriented love in a way we never could alone. And that, my friends, takes a sanctified heart. You can want to do good, but without the Spirit's help, you will always fail. If you want Him to come and to dwell in your body, in your mind and your spirit, as you desire to love somebody else, He will. But when He comes, He always comes with His standards, with His outlines, with His pattern, and it never changes. So we must offer to the world a picture of dynamic, holy sexuality, full of joy, full of His fruitfulness, full of His desire, because we're wanting to image Him and not to please ourselves. One final sentence. I believe that in the area of sex, there are no strong people, only wise and unwise. And I would pray the Lord would guide us by His Spirit and His Word to be a wise group of people, Christians, in this wild world in which we live, to offer light and truth and wholeness in this very important area of our lives. He can produce a depth of love in us, which in our hearts, which offers love for someone else, someone different than me, but someone who is very worthy of receiving faithful covenantal love. Thanks for sharing with me. At this time, I want to invite you to uh, participate in a live Q&A, question and answer session, which will follow here. Thanks for being with me today. I look forward to our continuing conversation.